and I left running away and for years I didn't do it again. I couldn't do it again because of the impact of his words. But eventually, some years later, I started I started to I started to smoke. I was young, I was maybe twelve years old. I started to smoke and cigarettes and then I went on weed because everyone was doing it on pot. And it was it was normal at this moment for me. But as was as I was young, I didn't have enough money to supply to my needs. So eventually it brought me to another point where I told myself maybe in this place I could take one or two euros, you know? And I did it again, years later. And I remember that at the beginning I was feeling very, very bad about it. I didn't want to be caught again the first time. But next time that it happened, then it was possible for me to do it again. I, I did it I did it once. So maybe I can I can do it again. So I did it again. And I was feeling bad again, you know, but not that much than I was feeling bad at the first time. And my conscience started to get weaker and weaker and weaker. And over the years it became a lifestyle for me, where the one or two euros became tens and twenties and fifties. And eventually, 10 years later, I, I was building strategies out of my workplace to, to, to make you know, to make a living of it, turning away a lot of money. And I, was, I didn't feel anything wrong about it at this moment, years later, because my conscience was so much affected by sin that I couldn't see that it was wrong anymore. It was normal. But I remember the day when I met God, the day I repented from my sins, I was alone in my car and I started to cry when I realized the state of my heart. I started to cry and realized that I was a sinner and he died for me. He was hanging on my cross. And at this moment, something, something changed inside of me. At the point where I, I was, sharing, a, I was sharing, sharing an apartment with a roommate. And just after, after that experience, I was taking a shower and I, I got short of, uh, of soap, a shower gel. And then I saw the bottle of my, my roommate. And I told myself, maybe I, I'm going to grab some. And the conviction came onto me at this moment that I, I, I was counting something that wasn't mine. And I couldn't without asking him before. So it's not something that someone came and, and told me, you cannot do that anymore. But I realized under conviction that that was wrong. And out of this new heart that God gave me, I couldn't do anymore what I was doing before. I couldn't live as the same. I couldn't live the same that I've lived for years before. And this is a picture of repentance. This is what repentance is doing to us. It's not a prayer. It's not just a decision. But it's something where God responds to us and changes something inside of us. In response to that, to that, to that move. And this is the picture of what is Christianity. Yeshua didn't come to build a religion, nor a religious system, but he came to change the inside of the people. When he was speaking to the Pharisees, he was telling them, you speak right, you do all the right prayers. In, in, in appearance, you're perfect, but inside of you, it's full of dead bones. And it illustrates what he came to do. He came to change the inside of us, change our hearts and make us new creations so that the wrong things who were coming out of us from the heart before can be renewed and can produce the right fruit, can produce holiness first, bottom line. So th this is what repentance is doing. This new heart renews our conscience. And this is exactly what the first disciples went around to preach. This is exactly what Yeshua was going around and preached. Repent. For the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent now. Okay? This is what their, their main focus. Even with Jews and Gentiles. Not only the love of God. But the fact that there is a judgment waiting for us if we don't change our ways. So this is repentance. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So we produce unto repentance, bottom line, holiness. 
we start to live a right holy life. This is the good news of the gospel. It changes us to produce this right fruit. But this is, this is just the beginning. Because now that we stop producing hell, we stop producing wrong fruit, and that we've been made right with the Father, now we can start to follow the perfect example. As in these last days, God spoke through the Son. He, was, he came as a model for us to follow. And if someone dwells in him, he must walk as Yeshua walked. And it's not just about observing Torah. This is bottom line. But it produces something else, something more. Where in the, in the matter of expressing love for God and love for people. His lifestyle was the one we were speaking about last week. He was going to the poor. He was healing the sick. He was setting people free from what demons have made into their lives with no legal rights. And he was even raising the dead when they were not supposed to be dead. So this is the way he showed his disciples to follow. When you walk now as a righteous man, when you walk now as a son and a daughter of God, when you have received this spirit that I promised to you, this is how you should walk. It starts with holiness, and it goes beyond that, with living a whole new lifestyle, where we walk according to the will of the Father, in the spirit as well, not in the flesh anymore. You follow me? So all of this is connected with the gospel, and it starts with repentance. I stop living for myself, I stop fulfilling my fleshly desires, and I start to love God and my neighbor with all my heart, and as myself. According to the example of Yeshua. So this is what repentance is doing. And this is yeah, the first step following faith in Yeshua. But now Peter at Pentecost says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And from today, I don't know any more a, a more controversial topic than baptism today in the body of Christ. That's, that's incredible and so sad that because of our so many traditions, we slipped away so far and in so many different ways of the original one. Because there is only one Bible. And there is only one way of doing the things, the one that we can see in the first, the first disciples. So repent and be baptized in the name of Yeshua for the remission of your sins. We see that Peter considered it so clear and important that 3,000, the whole, the whole congregation who responded this day, they were baptized right away at the day of Shavuot. So 300 people. It's taking time. You know? But as it was important, they did it. They did it anyway. So, as I was saying, we don't see such a thing as the sinner's prayer in the New Testament. But we see over and over, almost every two chapters in the book of Acts, even if it's with Jews or Gentiles, we see how people respond to the, the, the preaching of the gospel. And every time they responded, it was through water baptism. The same day. And today we slipped very far away from this. Very often because of our manly traditions. And today, baptism very often has become <laughs> An achievement, something that, that comes after, after a walk with him. Maybe after some months, sometimes after some years, sometimes even never happening. Because we made this something symbolic only. But for the church, for the, the first believers, this was not something symbolic at all. We came to, re, we, we came to reduce it to a symbol because of one verse saying saying that baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. We made this a ceremonial baptism where people share their testimony very often in front of a congregation saying, This is what Yeshua has made into my life. 
And now, as a next step with him, I want to be baptized eventually, and they, they got a paper very often. But we don't see, we don't see, this is not the whole picture of what the New Testament is giving about baptism. Because we see many different references about what is happening in water baptism. When someone is going into this water with faith, it's not that the water is magical. But Paul is talking about a baptism in Romans chapter 6 where we've been buried into Christ through baptism so that sin has no longer dominion over us. See, the thing, is, the, thing, the thing is, we all have sin and fall short of the glory of God, right? And the Bible says that the, the wage of sin is death. So, basically, because we sin, we need to die. We have to die. So, what is baptism? The first point that we read from Paul in Romans 6 and Colossians 3, 2, we, we read that baptism is a burial. We've been buried with him, with him into his death so that we can be resurrected. And we have been resurrected with him in order to walk in newness of life. So that the body of sin has been put to death and sin has no longer dominion over us. So as we all sin, we needed to die. And baptism is this picture of a burial. This is where we die with Christ. And where we're being united with him through this water. As it's written in Galatians as well, Paul is saying, don't you know that you who have been baptized, you have put on Christ. You've been united with him at this moment. So basically what baptism is, is the, the only day in your life that you can attend your own funerals. <laughs> and continue to live afterwards. But in newness of life. Because you sin, because we sin, and we needed to die, this day, when we realize our state, we repent to our God. He changes our conscience. And out of this renewing of the conscience, we die with Christ. And we're being united into Him through baptism, to walk and to be resurrected with Him, and to walk in newness of life, delivered from the power of sin. See, the Bible teaches that sin, sin is more than just a wrong decision that we take. Because Yeshua said, if someone commits sin, he becomes a slave to sin. And Paul is speaking about this law of sin and death. He's illustrating it as a, a non born person in Romans chapter 8. He's saying, when I was in this state, I found in myself a law, something acting against my own will. The good I want to do, I cannot do. But the wrong, the evil, I don't want to do, this is what I produce. So I see that it's not, it's not me, it's not my will. Even though I have a good conscience, I cannot produce the right truth. And I found this law, I find this law acting into me, the law of sin and death, forcing me, pushing me always to produce evil. And saying, what can set me free from this law? What can set me free from this bondage, you know? And he's saying this is through Yeshua, Mashiach, Mashiach. When I'm getting united with him, when I die with him, something is happening. And I'm getting set free from this law of sin and death. I will be able to produce now a new fruit in my life. It doesn't mean that we... We are not free to sin anymore. God forbid. But it means that we are free not to sin. Again, it's the word remission. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Remission means to be restored in the state you were before it was committed. So it means to be back in the garden. Before this fallen nature came, back in, came, came down into the world. Before they sinned, I mean, they had the choice. They had the choice to follow, to follow God and obey. But they didn't. <clears throat> and they fall short. From this moment, the whole mankind felt into bondage. 
of this sinful nature. But through the death of one righteous, of the Son of God, forgiveness has been, has been uh, made available to all those who are believing, who might believe. So that they can be free from this law of sin and death. See, the point is, he didn't come to, he didn't come to, see, to save us in our sins. He came to save us from our sins. To take us out of this sinful nature, of this sinful life, so that we can walk with God and love God with all our hearts. So, as we reduced baptism to something only symbolic, very too, too, too often, we, we are saying people, you know, you're bound to sin, you're slave to sin, but now that you prayed this prayer, eventually that you repented, you can now start to walk for God and with God and to produce holiness. But know that you're still bound to sin. So you're tied up to this wall, you know, to these chains of this law working into you again and again. But try, try to do it. Start to produce a holy life. Run the walk, you know, run the race, do it. And what is happening? As soon as we try, to live this holy life, we can go as far as this chain can go, but we're still bound to sin. We cannot do it. You cannot run a race if you're still tied to the, to, to the starting point. So we need to cut. We need to cut this, this cord that ties us to our old life, to our old nature, that sinful nature who produces only evil. It needs to die. And this is what baptism is doing. And I need to say, today our traditions are so different. And because it is different, we, we have 33,000 denominations today in the body of Christ saying different things. For some people, you know, living a sinful life is the norm of Christianity. You will never be able to produce a right holy life as Yeshua was doing because Romans 7. Paul is speaking about producing sin over and over, doing evil. But this is not the norm of Christianity. This is not what he was speaking about. He was speaking about someone who is not born again in this chapter. But in Romans 6, Romans 8, he's going back to what happened through the new birth. You've been set free from sin. You've been delivered from the power of sin. Sin has no dominion over you. You can walk in newness of life. You've been made new creations. Amen. This is what we are now through baptism. And I've met so many people who, and even myself, at the, fir at the first time, you know, when I repented, I was smoking. And I repented, I stopped. My conscience didn't want to do it again. I understood that God wasn't calling me to do it. He didn't want me to do it. But then I found in myself there was a fight. Because my body wanted to do it again, even though my conscience didn't want to. And what I, what I found is, when I got baptized one month later, I, I didn't realize what happened. But many of my fights stopped through baptism. Something happened. Not the full picture yet, but we, we met many, many people now uh, over the last years um, who didn't realize the full picture of what baptism is doing when someone is doing it in faith. And because of that, the only fruit that was happening in their walk with the Lord was striking against sin over and over with having the impression of like the law of gravity, you know? Even though you don't believe in gravity, if you drop, if you drop this glass, it will fall. It will fall over and over, even if you don't believe in it. <clears throat> And it's the same thing with sin. Even though we believe in it or not, the Bible says that it's a law and we are bound to it. So as long as we don't die, it will drive us. It will win. It's going to win over us. Over and over and over and over. And we've seen so many people living in bondage, even in church, reading the book, years after years, not knowing why I'm always falling. And I did the same at the beginning. I did the same at the beginning with temptation coming back, like pornography. At the beginning, it was the norm in my own life. I repented. God I turned away from that. Then 
temptation came back a few years after and without being able to control it, I fall. I fall again. Once. And you know what it's doing? What it's doing? If you hide sin, it's taking power over you, taking a grab. So you don't want to hide it. You confess. Confess it around you, someone you trust, confess it to God. So I confess once and it left. But a few years after, temptation came back. Fall again. Why? Hurting people, confessing again. I don't want to hide. Power of sin is in secret. But why? Why am I falling again and again? And at this moment, I went on a fast seeking God. No, why am I falling again and again? I repented. I don't want that thing in my life. Neither do you. And after this time of seeking God, drew me to Romans 6, and I realized what happened. What happened in baptism? What was my... Um, my position towards sin before and what it was, what was it now? Before I was slave to sin. It was driving my life. I couldn't control it. But when I died with him, it lost, lost its dominion over me. And now I wasn't a slave anymore. I was able to choose and to resist. And that, that's weird maybe to, uh, to, to describe it to you like this today. But the moment I realized it, I realized that I was free not to do it again and that I had the power over it, it stopped completely and never, never, never come back. So for years, I lived, even after baptism, but without realizing the power of baptism, and I wasn't free. And we met so many people walking like this in their walk with the Lord, confessing, you know, that all what the book is speaking about, about them, but not producing the fruit according to the book, the victorious life, over sin, over death, over anything. And this is so important that we, we, we can come back to the root of what, what, what it's really about in baptism. So we see that it was first a burial, a burial where the old person, the old self, is, uh, is dying, basically, in the water. So we bury this old life, the old sinful ways that we, we had. And this is, this is so powerful, because when we see someone responding to that calling, in faith, and coming down into that water, and to repentance, with a, the heart, with a heart fully committed, Saying to God, I turn, the, I turn away from all that stuff now. We've seen God meeting people in that what, these waters in such incredible ways that we couldn't believe it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We've seen people being healed in baptism. Not more than two weeks ago, of a lady who had problems in her shoulder, in the, in the stomach, over and over since many years, through baptism, she came out of the water because she buried all of this. She came out and she was healed completely. Amen. We've seen people getting set free from demons in water because demons harass people and they, they very often tie up people with words of the flesh. So because we sin, they have a, a ground in our lives. But when we repent and when we die, how can you torment a dead person? They have to leave. So we've seen people getting set free from demons right after coming out of the water. And the demon screaming and manifesting that, no, not the water, not the water, and they left. And the person was free and transformed. See, this is what Paul is speaking about. The gospel is the power unto salvation for those who believe. And we cannot be the same after coming to Christ and to a real, true, new birth experience, which means, which includes repentance, baptism, and receiving the Holy Spirit that we will speak about in a few minutes. You follow me still? So we've seen so, so many different things happening in baptism when people understand what they do. The water is not magical, it's not idolatry. But 
going down in that water in faith, understanding that I bear with this old person, with her old ways. God is coming and is making into that waters the person in incredible way. Few years, one year ago, we met a lady. She she came to faith two years ago in her living room alone. God met her through a radio station. She was living in a, in a, in a small township up north Gatineau. There was no church over there, but she listened to a radio station. She heard the gospel. She repented. She turned away from her sins. She started to read the Bible and to live according to it. But two years after, last year, she contacted us. She wanted to be, to be baptized. And she shared her story with, with us, telling that when she was young, her parents were playing Ouija board at home, fooling around with Ouija and uh, witchcraft, witchcraft at home. It was the norm. So as far as she could remember, there was evil spirits around, around them in the house. She could see, see them, she could feel them. And one day some, something happened. She was six years old. When we met her, she was 56 years old, 50 years later. But when she was six, one day she was in a rocking chair in the kitchen, and her mother stared at her in the eyes. And at this moment, her spirit left her body. She, she, she was floating in the ceiling. And seeing the whole, the whole room from the ceiling, and her body fall down, empty. But her mother, she, she took her back in her body. But from this moment, for fifty years, she was rocking. Any time she was rocking, she made a game of it. Eventually, her spirit was leaving her body, without having any control over it. And she's been living in bondage with that for fifty years. Who that set her free? Eventually, she, become, she became tormented more and more because of that. Mm -hmm. But when we heard her story before being baptized, we told her, you know, you can be free from that. God doesn't call you to, to make astral traveling on your own like this when you want, wherever. It's dangerous. So she realized it and she repented and decided to bury it through baptism as well. She came out of the water, she received the Holy Spirit, started to speak in tongues. And two days after, she came back home with a huge smile, saying, Girls, you know what? I can rock now. I'm free. So for her, it's just, it was just a um, <coughs> spiritual, soul time, maybe, spiritual time. But through baptism, this nature died. And it, it couldn't happen anymore. She was free. We had the same with another man who was seeking trying to find back um, um, a friend from his youth. He was, he was looking for him everywhere. He couldn't find uh, his contacts anymore. So eventually, after months of looking at, seeking for him, he went to a medium. And the man started to watch in the spiritual world to, to try to find <coughs> the old friend. But he couldn't. He told him, you know what, I'm sorry, but your friend is dead. What? My friend is dead? Yeah, yeah, your friend is dead. Your friend is dead. I, I even know the date of his de death. And the man was, he, he, was uh, he was very sad, no? But he took that, he left. But something happened a few months after. One day he was walking in the street and he saw his friend. And he said, what are you doing there? You're supposed to be dead. He told him, I'm not dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been told you, you're dead. I even had the date of your death. And he showed him the date. And the guy told him, oh, I understand what, what you saw. I became a Christian since then. <laughs> and the date you're telling me is the date of my baptism. Wow. <laughs> so that man has become a new person. Oh, and man. even from the spiritual world, it was not looking the same. I couldn't find him because of that act. Yeah. The Bible says that now... Our life is hidden in Christ with God. And something really happens. New birth experience is not something we do. It's something God does to us in response to our faith. So it's not religion. It's interaction. It's relationship. It's changing something in us. 
He's putting Christ over us, his righteousness, but his nature as one. We become new creation, new, the new man. And this is why Colossians 3 say, now that you've been baptized, put off the old man. Stop producing the same fruit than before. You're not that person anymore. And put on the new man that renews himself according to the image of the one who created him. According to Yeshua. What has he won? After being born again. This is our calling. And this is what happened in baptism, specifically. So we can ask many different questions now. One thing we don't see in the Bible is infant baptism as well. Because we saw now that baptism is connected with repentance. So if someone is being baptized without repentance, he's just taking a good bath. Basically, it's what it does. So we don't see infant baptism in the Bible because babies cannot repent. They don't have a. Sh they are not sin conscious. They cannot turn away from it. Eventually, they didn't sin. So, it, baby baptism, even though you, we call it baptism, it's not baptism. So, if you've been baptized only as an infant, please come to a conviction that you need to go through the waters. How many of us here have been baptized as babies? Pretty much all of us, almost. What if we ask the same question to the first church in the book of Acts? No one here would have raised their hand. Because, because they knew it. They know that they knew that <coughs> expression of repentance. They knew also that baptism is not a specific religious word. Word. I mean, baptism only means immersion. It's a normal word in Greek. It means to go under water. As when we wash the dishes, we plunge the dishes in the water. This is what is the word baptismal in Greek. We baptismal the dishes. So we know that to, to wash something unclean, it has to go fully under water. We cannot just sprinkle a few... Uh, a little bit of water on it to wash it, right? It doesn't work. So, baptism is not sprinkling of water, neither. But it's a burial. When you bury something, you put it all under, down earth, right? So, it starts with that. And we can, we can wonder many different things now, you know? Yeah, but you say that baptism is important. What do you mean? Like, 1 Peter 3, 22, it's saying that in the days of Noah, what God has done through Noah, it was a picture of that baptism that now saves us. And we can now wonder, do you mean that if 